呃，下一个题目是来自这个 Hugging Face 的这个 Big Code Project。嗯、呃，他是其实他主要是会去讲这个，呃 ，open and responsible training of LLMs for code， 那是开放和负负责任的代码大模型的训练啊。呃 ，Big Code 项目呢是 Hugging Face 和 ServiceNow 公司引领的，呃，一个致力于开发代呃代码大语言模型的这么一个项目。呃 ，Big Code 呢希望通过开发高质量的开源模型，促进大。呃，人工智能和软件工程领域的透明度，并增加这个呃，加强数据管理。那它的主要成就呢，就是呃，发布了可以用于大大模型训练的开源数据集，以及一个开源的这个代码大模型叫 Star Coder 啊。那么为我们演讲的，这是来自这个法兰西的 Hugging Face 的机器学习工程师 Lubna Ben。啊、uh, ，no， right？ Yeah。啊，他是这个呃 ，Big Code 项目的核心成员，是 core member of Big Code。呃，那么上面的这些这些数据集工作和 Star Coder 大模型，他都是参与开发的。So, Miss Ano, welcome to Shanghai. The stage is yours. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to give you this talk today about large language models for code. Uh, so that's a very trendy topic in machine learning right now, just like AI and LLMs. And um, it feels like everyone is focusing on getting a strong performance. And an important aspect is getting overlooked, which is the responsible development of these models. So today, I'm going to tell you how at Big Code we try to combine both to have a strong code generation model, but also do it in a very open, transparent, and responsible approach. So yeah, when we talk about code generation models, you probably think of GitHub Copilot first, which is this VS Code extension which can, which can also complete your code. And if we look a little bit about the code generation space, this is the kind of the progress. So before Codex, there were some models which were kind of small. They weren't very strong at code generation. And then Codex was released by OpenAI, and then DeepMind released AlphaCode, and then Code Whisper. So very exciting things were happening in this space. But these models are not actually open source. So if you want to use, for example, Codex or Code Whisperer, you can only do it via an API. So you would need to send your data to a third party, which is not very secure, and some companies don't want to do that. And for example, for AlphaCode, there isn't an API. And we don't have a lot of details about how these models were trained. So it's very hard to reproduce them. And this is when the open source community tried to release and train these uh, models that work just as good as Codex. For example, there was CodeGen, Encoder, and other models. But unfortunately, the performance wasn't matching that of these closed models. So this is why there is a lot of open questions. And these questions are related to performance, to get good performance not just on Python, but also on other programming languages. And also about transparency regarding the training data. Which data did these, uh, the authors of these models use to train these models? And is there a way if someone wants to opt out, for example, if they don't want to be included in the training or things like that. There's also some questions about the evaluation of these models. Uh, sometimes people evaluate only on one benchmark, which is not very comprehensive. So it's very important to have like a very large suite of evaluation to really test these models and know how they would behave in production. So at Hugging Face, we try to start training models like this and do this in an open way. So a year ago, we released Code Parrot. So this was more of an educational tool to just have the pipeline to train a code model. It didn't focus a lot on performance. And a few months ago, we released Star Coder, and it's a very strong 15 billion code generation model, which is trained on more than 80 programming languages. And it uh, outperforms the original Codex model released by OpenAI uh, on Python and also other languages. And it's only used permissive data for the training. So I'm going to explain later what that means. 
Uh, so big code, why did we start it? So we wanted to train the, a model and we always knew that we were gonna open source it. So we had two options. Either we were gonna do it in house and then do our training on our own and then release the model to the community. Or we were gonna start an open collaboration so that everyone can follow the progress from the beginning, from when we start curating the data to when we train the model to when we release it. So that's what, is, what Big Code is. It is a collaboration between Hugging Face and ServiceNow, but it's very open, meaning that anyone can join. If people here in the audience can join, they can do so. And we have more than 500 participants from over 30 countries. So these are people who are collaborating to kind of train these models. And why did we start Big Code? Uh, it's because we wanted to address some of the concerns in the closed development of these models. So this starts with not releasing the training data. So most of models that are released now, for example, even Llama or Code Llama, they didn't release their training data. And even in the paper, they, didn't cover, they don't, don't give a lot of details about how they curated it and prepared it. So that's one approach we don't like. And then it also goes to not releasing the model weight. So this is the case, for example, for GPT-4 or ChatGPT. If you want to fine tune these models, it's not easy because you don't have the checkpoints. And then you would need to send your data to them and it is not because the models are not hosted in premise. And sometimes you might have sensitive data so we don't want to send it to a third party. And needless to say, this makes these models and their performance not reproducible. Aside from needing a lot of compute, we don't have all the technical details to do so. So this is why we started Big Code, and what we're trying to do is exactly the opposite of all of this. Uh, so for example, in our training, we released our data, it is public, you can go there, you can inspect it and see which files and repositories are included. If you don't want to be in the training, you can just opt out. The model weights are public, we also released scripts for fine tuning the models, and since the model is public, you can do on-prem deployment, so you deploy it internally and then your developers can just use the tool without having to send their data to third parties and yeah everything is fully documented so by doing the code we're hoping that like more and more companies and institutes will start to do like us and like be very transparent about how they're developing these models because that's like the way forward in open source um, so what does training these models look like when you want to do it from scratch so we all know that it's like hundreds or maybe thousands of GPUs and terabytes of data, but hopefully you'll get to know that this is not enough and there's a lot that goes behind the scenes. So yeah, I'm gonna, everything I'm gonna tell you is like about a model called Starcoder, which is a code generation model that we released uh, maybe two months ago. Uh, let's first start with data, which is I think the most important component when it comes to training these models. So to train, we want to train a code model, so it needs to learn how to code, and what's the best way to do that is to train it on code that developers wrote. And GitHub is like the central place for uh, open source repositories. So what we did to crawl and prepare this data set was to clone all of the data that's on GitHub. So we ended up with 100 terabytes of data, which is huge. But then this data sometimes can, ha can have like files that or languages that we're not interested in. So we did some filtering based on the extensions, for example, to only keep Python files, C++ files, but we ended up with more than 300 programming languages. This gave us almost 90 terabytes of data. And since we're very invested in like data governance, we, since in the repository it can either be permissive license like MIT or Apache 2, or it can be a copyleft li left license like GPL, or the repository can just not have a license. So we only kept code that had a permissive license which allows you to use it. And this like dropped the data size from 70 terabyte to 6.4 terabyte. And the last step we did was like remove duplicates since in GitHub there are a lot of forks. So a lot of files look very similar. And there were studies that have shown that it's better to train your model without these duplicates. So we should only keep one copy of each file. So this step is called uh, deduplication. And after that, uh, we lost almost half of the size of, of the data set. And so we released this data set that is called the stack. It's public. Anyone can use it. It has almost three terabytes of uh, code from GitHub. Um, yeah, these are like some numbers about like uh, the number of programming languages. And what's very cool with the stack is that it has an inspection tool. 
So this is a repository hosted on Hugging Face Hub. You can go there and you can type your GitHub username and it tells you which of your repositories are there. So for example, these are some repositories from my colleague and he has like five in the stack, so we train on them. But if you go there and you don't want to be included in our future trainings, you just have to fill a form and we'll make sure that when we train a new model, we're not gonna include any of your repositories. So this is like one step forward to having like transparent and uh, good data governance in a way that you give developers a say in whether they want you to include and train on their data or not, because it's theirs at the end of the day. Um, and then we do a lot of data curation, uh, since this data can be very noisy, the quality might be bad, and we don't want to train our model on everything. Uh, so first we did language selection to only keep uh, languages that are maintained, uh, exclude config. So we, from 300 programming languages, we only kept 86. And we did that with the community. So we asked people which languages you want to be included and try to see popularity and metrics like that. And then we did some quality inspection. So since we have a lot of collaborators in BigCode, we kind of created a demo. And for each language, we selected 100 random files. And people just looked at them to see if there are like any outliers and if any filters would make more sense. So that was like uh, the quality inspection phase. So that kind of took a lot of time like to curate these data sets. That's probably something that not everyone talks about. You think that you just need a lot of data and a model and a lot of GPUs in a train. And that's not actually the case if you want to performance, you should invest some time in a lot of data curation. After that, we did deduplication. As I said, you need to remove duplicates. It's not good for the models to see a lot of files that look alike from the beginning, because it's gonna, the data is going to be less diverse, and the models tend to memorize text instead of like getting creative in their generations. So there are some very interesting papers that kind of study the deduplication effects on like model performance. After that, we did the decontamination, because after we train these models, we're going to need to evaluate them, and we have benchmarks to do so. Um, but if you don't do this decontamination step, which is making sure that your evaluation benchmarks are not in your training set, meaning that you didn't train your model to solve your tests, which is basically data leakage, and the evaluation results, you, you guys are not going to be representative of the real model performance. So that's a very important step that you need to do before you start your training. Um, one other thing we did, and it is more related to data governance, is to remove personal identifiable information. So believe it or not, people are pushing API keys and SSH keys in, on GitHub. And although I think on GitHub they have a mechanism to kind of flag them and tell developers, uh, there are still a lot of secrets out there. And you also have names and usernames and emails. And if you just train the model on that, it's probably going to memorize them. And when you use it during inference, it might just output like API keys and they might be valid, so which is not very secure and you don't want your model to do that. So we spent a lot of time I'm trying to come up with a good approach to remove personal identifiable information. There are like some models out there to do so, but they're more focused on natural text on English. But here we have code, so it's very different. Uh, so one first approach we tried was to use regexes. So there are some tools like detect uh, secrets, which is like very popular. Like people can use it to kind of block, uh, like it, it flags when you push a file or a commit that has a secret. And uh, we also added some post-processing filters because we found that it had like a very high rate of false positives and also false negatives. And so we, for example, we added the gibberish detector because when you flag a key using a regex, sometimes it might be just like natural text. So this gibberish detector, it checks if this key is actually gibberish. And we had also some other filters like removing hashes because sometimes the tool would think that it's secret, but it's actually just a hash and things like that. But even after like a lot of extensive like post-processing, this approach was still like not great. So the advantage to using regex is they're fast to apply. You can like run them on your data set even though it's very large. I mean, it's still just like uh, very fast, but it doesn't work for some PII types, for example, for names. You can't have a regex that detects names. And yeah, as I said, the performance was not great. So we decided to use another approach, which is a little bit more expensive. It took a lot more time, but it was worth it. Uh, we decided to train a, a machine learning model, which does token classification. So you give it code in each block. It tells you if it's a secret or not, like for each word or token. 
so to do that, we first needed the base model that you could fine tune because this is a fine tuning task, not a pre-training task. And usually if you want to do a task like token classification, you don't use a decoder model, you need an encoder model. So we trained an encoder model called Star, Star Encoder. And then after that, we needed a data set that we can train our model on. So we collaborated with a company called Toloka and we, they could prepare like a crowdsourcing it was a task to annotate 12,000 files for PII, that is names, emails, keys, and passwords, and IP addresses. And we prepared the data sets, and basically annotators would look through the files, and whenever they found some PII, they would flag it to its correct type. And one thing we made sure like, uh, to do was to pay these annotators and give them fair wage, because that's also a very big concern in machine learning right now. Um, for example, when you train, to turn chat GPT, you had a base model, and then after that, they did a step called like reinforcement learning with human feedback. And to do that, you need to, to do a lot of annotations. And sometimes, some companies would go to uh, third world countries and just exploit those workers. And so it's very important to try try to pay them fairly. And what we did was to uh, select countries. We had like a minimum wage of I think $7.5. And we only selected countries where that wage would be equivalent to the highest minimum wage in the US. So we did a lot of analysis to make sure like, that, that that wage made sense in the countries where the annotators were from. And the last thing is like to apply this. So it took 800 GPU hours to do the inference. Uh, so I think, yeah, it could be like more expensive than that, but it was worth it to remove this PII. And then after we detected all this personal information, we masked it with placeholders. For example, for names, we had a token that says name, and for API addresses, we removed, the, we replaced them with like uh, private IP addresses and uh, so on. And this is to show you the difference between the regex approach and this approach, which is NER plus pseudo labels. And you can see that, for example, for keys, uh, the precision was really low. And this, we found that this was uh, especially because of some programming languages where like these metrics were kind of disproportionate. And when we moved to the NER approach, we managed to get 70% F1 score, which is a big improvement. Um, so that was it for data curation. The last step was to format the data set. Since we didn't only train on code, we also trained, uh, trained on GitHub issues, Jupyter notebooks, and Git commits. So for example, for Git commits, it had a special structure because you have the file before the commit, the commit message, and the file after the commit. So the way we structured them is that we separate them with like special tokens, it's like special words, to tell the model that it is in a Git commits format. And if you try to use that, for example, with star coder during inference, it, it might be very cool because, for example, you give it the Fibonacci and you say commit message is add type hints to this function. And then when you generate, it knows that it, had, it has to add like type hints. And this is cool because this is a base model. It is not trained to follow its instructions. It is only trained to complete your code. But because we added this format, we can add instructions without fine tuning. Um, the other data that we formatted is Jupyter Notebooks because we had markdown cells, code cells, and then output cells. So we also concatenated them with special tokens. And if you use the model during inference, sometimes it can act as a Python interpreter. So you give it some code and it can try to predict what the output could be. So yeah, sometimes the predictions are not accurate, but it's still like a promising thing to explore. Uh, if you're interested in doing, so for us, the tools that we use for data processing are data sets library from Hugging Face, which has some powerful features if you want to do like a lot of data curation on large data sets. Uh, it has like filter and map methods which use multi-processing. And if you combine, for example, map with like a, a large batches, it can be like very fast in the processing. And then the last step was to tokenize the data set. If you're trained with a tool, for example, Hugging Face Transformers or Trainer, you can tokenize the data set with tokenizers. Or if you're using a special tool like we did, Megatron LM, it already has like some tools to do tokenization. Since you train these models, you can train on text. You need like number representations. Uh, so that was it for data curation. Now let's see training. Uh, so regarding the architecture choices, we went for a 15 billion code generation model and we added a feature called multi-query attention, 
which makes uh, inference on large batches much faster than if you weren't to use the feature. We also used uh, an 8,000 context length, which allows you to fit like a lot of text and a lot of code in your uh, model's context. And this can be very useful, for example, in a VS Code extension. If you want to add context from other files that are not the file that you're working on, for example, something that is imported, it is very important to have like a large context so you can add more information so your predictions become better. And the last thing that the model supports is infilling. So since this model is a decoder model, it's a bit like GPT-3 and GPT-2, and it processes text from left to right. But in code, sometimes you want to modify something inside. For example, you have a function and you want to add a doc string. So you know your mo you want your model to know context that's both on the left and on the right. So the master coder supports that with a feature called fill in the middle. And regarding the training, uh, we did it on like 500 GPUs on the Hagen Face cluster, and it took 24 days. It was kind of a smooth sailing. Uh, we had only to do like few restarts. They were automatic, uh, which is why you have different colors like on the loss curve, but the loss just kept going down for like the all the period of the training. And we used Megatron LM for the training with like uh, MQA and flash attention. So this is a family tree of our models. So we released StarCoder Base and StarCoder, which is like StarCoder Base fine-tuned on more Python. So it does much better at Python, but also on other programming languages. We also have StarCoder Plus, if you want a good code model, but that is also good at natural language. So we took our model StarCoder Base and we fine-tuned it on like natural language, like mostly English, from the refined web data set that was used for Falcon model. And then there are like some instruction models. These are like, uh, because the model model is based, it is not like a chatting assistant, you can't give it instructions. So we did some instruction tuning and released StarChat Alpha and StarChat Beta. So these are like instruction tuned models that you can ask questions to, you can like talk to them. And yeah, the family tree became a big ecosystem. So because we released the stack data sets, this is bec has become kind of the default data set that people use to train their code models. So for example, Salesforce, Stability, Replit, and DC, they all use the stack to train like their uh, code generation models. And the community also took star coder and fine tuned it to kind of get more powerful models. For example, the Wizard LM team uh, fine tuned star coder to get Wizard coder. There's also Pangu coder too from Huawei. And then there's the Fog SQL coder, which is like the best uh, SQL chatting assistant out there. Uh, so it's like this is what happens when you open source your data set and you open source your model. You kind of give uh, people tools to build on top of your models and make things better. Uh, so that was it for training regarding evaluation. Uh, the way we evaluate these models is that, for example, we give them a doc string and a function signature, and they have to complete uh, the function, and then you run it against unit tests, and you compute like a metric called pass at k. Uh, some more uh, very popular benchmarks are like human eval, which has 160 Python problems that was released by OpenAI. So almost feels like a lot of people are just using this, but if you see someone evaluate, releasing a model and only evaluating on human eval, please ask them to also give you the results on other benchmark, which is because it's just not enough. It's only 160 problems. How can you evaluate a model on just that? So that's, for example, MultiPLE, which has a lot of programming languages, DS1000, which is on Python, but it has a lot of libraries and APPS. So this is a table to show the performance of StarCoder compared to other models. So yeah, up at, until like maybe a month ago, it was like the best open source model. And for example, Wizard Coder and Octo Coder are based on StarCoder. They are fine-tuned versions, so they improved on it. And this is like uh, a leaderboard that we released to compare code models. So uh, recently, uh, Meta released Code Llama, which is also a very, very strong code model. And some people instruction tuned it. So now you can find like there's Star Coder, but there's also a lot of other nice alternatives if you want to go for them. Uh, we have some code completion tools like the VS Code extension. We have an Emacs plugin, a Vim plugin, a JetBrains Jit plugin that's all use Star Coder. And uh, we also have a license for the model, which uh, allows uh, commercial use. And uh, it also so allows free derivatives, and it is royalty free. The only restriction it has is uh, ethical. So unless you're planning to use the model for malware generation, you should be good to use the model. Uh, the only restrictions are when someone wants to use it for uh, harmful uh, 
uh, cases. So why would you use star coder and not use, for example, another model? We think uh, the, the big code models are strong, but they're also very responsibly developed. For example, we only kept permissive li licenses in the training, and we also have an opt-out mechanism to allow developers to opt out if they want. We also removed personal identifiable information from the training and made sure that the annotators were paid fairly. And then we also developed code attribution tools. I forgot to mention that, but this is very important. Because for example, if you train on MIT, for it doesn't, if, you, if your model generates code that is exactly the same, you should still attribute the author. So yeah, for what's next, we're training a new version of StarCoder. We're also gonna release a new version of the stack which has more data, which has also newer data. And if you're interested to join, you can scan this QR code and fill form, and we'll be very happy to collaborate with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Anna. We can have one or two questions. We have uh, one or two questions in one and two minutes. Thank you for your speaking. I would like to see the uh, PII removal tool or model you are using. If that tool are available separately, uh, we can find somewhere. Yeah, it's uh, every everything I presented is like open source. So if, if you go in the big code organization hugging face, we're gonna find something that lists everything. So the model is called Star PII, and it's uh, open source. You can use this, and also the pipeline that we use to run inference is available on, on GitHub. If you don't find it, you can just contact me, and I point you to it. But it's okay. called Star PII on the hugging face hub. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, quick question: that that uh, code uh, attribution. Has that been implemented? Yeah, it's implemented and it's in the VS Code extension. So if the model generates code that was copied verbatim from the training data, meaning it didn't change it, it just generates something that it, it copied, uh, it is flagged in the extension and the warning is showed. And if you click on the link, it shows you where it came from. So this means if code is copied, you can find the original author and you can attribute him if you want. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Cool. One more? Hi, Lovna. Hi. Yeah. Uh, good to see, uh, to, to, to watch your presentation again. Uh, similar question with last time. I think uh, I, last time I asked from different way. So this one, the PII. So you mentioned the technique is mask or remove. So how that mask works? For example, uh, if your telephone number was removed certain mm. digits, then your name was removed part of that but they still maybe link your other information to identify you. So how that mask uh, exactly worked? Yeah. Is that recoverable after the mask? Yeah, so the entities we mask are like uh, names, I think keys and emails and usernames. And for each one of them, we mask them with like, for example, there's a word that says mask and it's between like, uh, um, some special tokens. So when the model sees that, it knows that it is something that is masked. So the original information that was there, it's not there anymore. So people can't identify you. If you had like a code file and there was your name and your email, they were masked with another word. And this is the word for all the secrets. It's the same, so it doesn't identify you. Uh, does that answer your question? Because like all the secrets that were in the file, they are now masked with like just words that are the same uh, to say that this is something that was masked. Okay, okay. cool. Thank you. Thank you.